Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's conversation in real life. <gasps> Incredibly exciting. I might cry before it even starts. <laughs> Yay. And by live stream um, at State Library Queensland in celebration of entwined plants and people. The stunning exhibition, exhibition sorry, celebrating and exploring the complexity and beauty of plants, the intrinsic and fundamental relationships between people and plants and our everyday interactions and relationships with them, our biological friends. My name's Ashley Hayen. I'm the editor of Griffith Review. It is my utter pleasure to be in conversation this evening with Holly Ringland, award-winning author of The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart and co-presenter of the similarly beautiful new ABC series, Back to Nature. There's some pretty exciting sentences to say. I'm not reckon? coping, I, <laughs> still. So I'll just sit here awkwardly and look at my boots. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the landscape in which we sit, the traditional lands of the Yagara and the Turrbal people alongside the waters of the Maywa and underneath this particular sky. I'd like to acknowledge elders, past and present, and I'd like to acknowledge to the particular privilege of being able to make a life here and to share this place after millennia of custodianship. I'd also like to acknowledge the privilege of being able to come together to share our stories at a time when so many people in this country and all around the world are being kept so far apart. Perhaps the idea of entwining has a different kind of resonance now. Now, to help the audience entwine with me and Holly, we're going to save some time for questions at the end. Um, there is a nifty new high-tech way for you to do this, which is not shouting at me, although that will work. <laughs> um, there's this thing called Slido. There's a barcode on the screen. Um, if you are on the live stream, I think the barcode is somewhere that you can see it as well. You can also go to the slido.com website, S-L-I-D-O.com, and use the hashtag SLQEntwined, with a capital E on entwined, um, those questions will appear as if by magic in front of us. Um, I'm going to talk to Holly for about 45 minutes and we'll leave some time for your questions at the end. So let's start in the room. And I was glancing back at the event information about this evening's conversation. I saw that the library suggested that Holly and I would be talking about all the green things in Holly's life. Books, films, bushwalks, flowers, tattoos. I had a feeling even before I saw Holly this evening that we might be a little bit more multicoloured than that in terms of where the conversation was going to go. So I want to start, Holly, by asking you to dive back into the earliest part of your world, to take us back to the first landscape, the first garden or the first tree or the first plant that you can remember as far back as you can go. I'm going to cry in the first two minutes, <laughs> Ash. I'm, tr I'm trying to, to break our record of me <laughs> choking up. Um, Firstly, can I just say thank you so much for coming and being here. I'm, look, I'm all wobbly. It's so amazing to be with you in person. And this is the first um, event that I've done since Back to Nature has gone to air on telly, which is its own level of surrealism. So it's just really lovely to see you and thank you for being kind faces in the audience. I'm joining you today from where I'm living at the moment with my partner Sam and my beautiful parents who have won COVID, they say, because we're at home again with them. <laughs> um, and we're all together on Yugam Bear land, so we've come up today to be here. My folks are in the second row. Um, uh, which is... <laughs> Which is going to make answering um, the first question really like impossible because I can't look at mum. Um, but my love of country and nature and landscapes, probably like for many of us, started in the gardens of the women who raised me. That was my mum's mum, my granny. Mum, I can't look at you, don't. You don't. Uh, that was my mum's mum, granny. And... Um, and my mum similarly, similarly had a garden. I was born and grew up on the central Queensland coast area in Gladstone. And um, granny, had a, granny and granddad lived in a Queenslander on stilts. And the most sentient and magical 
uh, being in my little life was the mango tree in the backyard and it was huge mm -hmm. and it fruited like you know everybody in our family remembers eating frozen mango out of ice cream containers with forks because granny would pick them and slice them and freeze them for us and that mango tree had a swing in it which all 12 of us grandkids took our turns on and uh we sat under it for family gatherings and it was Christmas and it was funerals and it was grief and it was joy. It was the place that we converged because the kitchen wasn't big enough. <laughs> so we would all be under the mango tree and Granny and Mum had gardens. And I remember saying to Granny when I was, I was very confused about why everybody went to church and talked to God. And I was about three or four and, you know, Grandad would go and, and I just said to Granny one day, what, what is this God? What is God, Granny? And she took me down to the garden and there were white trumpet flowers by this old brick barbecue. And she picked one up with a finger because grannies are just, everything they do is magical and deeply meaningful. And she just picked up a flower with one finger and I looked into it and she was like, this is God. And I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and so through granny and through mum reading to me in the garden outside, like hot Queensland, mm. central Queensland weather, the garden was a damp, green, beautiful space. So it was the, it was the mango tree in granny's garden, but it was the gardens of granny and mum that instilled a love of magic and refuge and solace in me. Yeah. I want to come back to the sentient mango tree a little mm. bit later on. Mm. Um, but I want to just sit with, I can remember, I think it's in your biog note, you talk about growing up running wild yeah. in a garden. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about the, the important sort of connection and relationship between all the life and growth of the garden, mm. the one hand, yeah. but that freedom, that liberty, oh to just be in it mm. in a really particular way as a kid? It's something that as I get older, I am more and more grateful for where I grew up. I grew mm. up a block from the Broadwater uh, on Bundjalung country um, on the Gold Coast. And I was running between a treehouse made out of a pallet wedged into the forks of a bottle brush tree in the backyard and um, a bohemia bush in mm -hmm. mum's back garden that I figured I could crawl through the exterior of and inside there was a tunnel. So once I crawled through the exterior and I was in the tunnel inside, you couldn't see me. So I gave my mum 40 million heart attacks <laughs> up through my childhood because I would say, mum, I'm going into the backyard and then she would come out and there's no child in the backyard because I was in the tunnel bush. That's what we called it, the tunnel bush. And between that, I would run a block to the Broadwater when the Gold Coast Highway was still two lanes. And um, I know, remember that? And uh, there's a picture that mum has of me when I'm like four or five and I'm sporting some very foretelling Australian native flower bikini bottoms nice. with my jumper. Mm -hmm. And that was winter. Perfectly dressed. That was my, that was my winter at the beach. Mm -hmm. And I'm like storming down the Broadwater with seaweed in one hand and I'm barefoot and I'm carrying some shells, something else in the other hand. And it wasn't weird to me, of course, because that's how I grew up. But mum's garden and the sea was an extension of my home. And I had those push out bay windows mm. in the old sort of coastal houses. And I had a desk against that window and I could get on the desk and jump out of the desk into the ferns. So m to mum's delight. So um, <laughs> mum taught me to read when I was three, which was the, the one of the greatest gifts she's ever given me. And the combination of feeding my brain stories and letting me be in the world mm. without shoes on and 
making mud pies and being in the ocean and, you know, I wasn't allowed to watch, um, I mean, like, not, not allowed, Mum, but, like, <laughs> you know, it was channel... Discouraged. Discouraged from watching anything that wasn't on the ABC, mm. which has also been quite fortuitous <laughs> um, in, the, in the circle of things. So my imagination was very well fed. It's like 6.30 Disney on mm -hmm. Sunday nights on Channel 7. That was, that was the deal. wild, like, commercial immersion. Yeah. 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 Regional Growing television. Re yes. I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to talk too, it seems to me there's a particular relationship. This is a question I probably shouldn't ask you thinking about the second <laughs> row. <laughs> Between your mum and your sense of place, yeah. how how the sort of sense of safety and nurturing, you know, she and the gardens are pretty intersectional, I think. Yes. Great. Yep. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... Um, wherever we have lived, mum's always had a corner of a garden. And <laughs> Why are you here? This, <laughs> whose idea was this? Um, I promise I would not have written these <laughs> questions if I had any idea you were going to be here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but even in the hardest times in our lives, mum has had a, mum has had a corner where, where something would be nurtured, something would be watered, something would grow. And uh, now she has three acres <laughs> and... Um, and I, I joke about it, but I'm not joking. I mean, I, I sit, I'm, I'm writing at the moment in a um, vintage caravan that I bought as my plan B in COVID so that I would have a dedicated writing space to write my next novel. And the beautiful thing about sitting in it and writing is that my, the writing desk faces the three windows in the caravan where the dining area traditionally is. So I have a view out three windows which could be distracting but it's all into the three acres of mum and Gaz's property. So the beautiful thing I write with headphones in so that I can go deep where or at least try fingers crossed go into where I need to go to write but the the thing I'll sit and chuckle to myself out loud because I'll be in the middle of a scene and I'll look up and mum will be marching across a paddock with a little wheelie trailer full of like plants, <laughs> you know, pitchfork, bag of potting, potting mix. And it's just like, I just watch her march across the three acres and I'm like, well, a patch of dirt is about to get pointed at and told to grow. And sure enough, something will obey. And that's, um, that's the blessing of having a mum like that is, is the natural world and reading is mm -hmm. what she gave me from the minute I was born. I'm not sure you could get two better gifts than that. I think no, you, you're pretty well stocked no, if you go into the world with that. She's all right. Yeah, she's keeper. All right. She's a keeper. She's a keeper. Yeah. 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 She's all right. Um, I want to jump forward a little bit from childhood to a different landscape and the time that you spent in Central Australia. Um, that's a job that requires a, a particular sense of place, mm. a, a particular um, relationship with the landscape. You were there working as a ranger in one of the national mm. parks. How did you end up in the middle of the continent? <laughs> and what spoke yeah. to you of the plants and the places that you found there? Ashley, hey, you ask the best questions. <laughs> well, um, I cheat. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, truth. I ended up in the middle of the continent because I was broken and lost and I didn't know who I was and I'd been backpacking in Canada at the age, I think, I think you can only kind of do this in your 20s, like living out of a backpack and living in hostels and being okay with all the weird and wonderful and weird things that happen um, in a backpacking life. Mm -hmm. And I think I had done that, I was 22, and I think I had done that thinking that um, the trauma I was living with that I didn't know I was living with was actually just feeling a bit restless and lost and deeply anxious. And if I went overseas where I knew no one with barely any money and backpacking, surely that would fix it. 
Um, and so, huge surprise, came home to the Gold Coast where nothing had changed and nothing was fixed either. I was just in a wor worse off position than before <laughs> I left and had no money. Uh, so I worked at a call centre. I got a temp job in a call centre and was lucky and privileged to be able to get a job and have income. But it wasn't my passion in my life, um, doing data entry for a telecoms co company. And uh, I had a friend who had gotten a job in hospitality out at Uluru. And I was like, you can go and get a job at Uluru? <laughs> and so, jump forward a bit, um, I piggybacked on her moving out there. I, I went out there to give it a try and I hadn't seen red dirt like that before. Mm. I'd seen volcanic dirt like around Jambrain or Mount Tambourine and the national parks here, but I didn't know the Western Desert or the center. And for the rest of my life, I will never forget the experience of getting off the plane, flying from Brisbane. You couldn't fly direct. You had to fly Brisbane to Sydney and it cost like an organ in price mm -hmm. to get there. So I had to fly Brisbane to Sydney and then Sydney uh, to Yulara, to the airport there. And the wall of dry heat when you walk off the plane and from the plane seeing Uluru sitting in the, in the distance and knowing that I was there with a one-way ticket and, um, and I wasn't a visitor. And so I got a job at the National Park by a stroke of luck and I became the senior media officer of the National Park, which just meant that any film crew or photographer that wanted to come to the National Park and take any imagery for commercial purposes, they got an 11-page permit application and me <laughs> in my Yogi Bear greens in my uniform. Um, it was the hardest and most beautiful landscape that I've ever had the honour and privilege to walk on and live on, on a new land, um, Pitanjara area. And it taught me everything I didn't learn in school about what it means to be on this country and what it means to be a global citizen. And that landscape, Jeannie Gunn, who wrote We of the Never Never, she wrote something in it, something along the lines of, and we who have lived in it and loved it and left it can never, never rest away from it. And it will haunt me and be with me and I will love that place forever. And I, I fell in love with the greatest thing anybody who's visited the red dirt will know is that it's not barren. Mm -hmm. There are gullies of desert oak trees, some of which are a thousand years old there are wildflowers there that pop up out of nothing after rain. And what those plants and trees taught me was resilience, which I really needed while I lived there. And there were three desert oaks in particular, and they were my grandmothers. They were like, you know, it was being underneath them really mm -hmm. gave me that feeling like granny, like three grannies <laughs> were kind of like giving me counsel. So I returned to them often after work and even living and living and looking at it and working, looking at images of it and being saturated with that country, it never wore off. I love that um, the way the green, since we are supposed to be talking about green, yes. the way the green, um, as you say, it kind of comes out of nothing and yeah. just those little... Um, moments and flashes of renewal and and life. Yes, there's something incredible in being in the right place at the right time the to right see time. that. I think. Were you there a long time before that happened? Before you saw that country sort of wake up with the water? I was I was so lucky to live there for about four years altogether. Mm. 
So it's quite funny when in periods, in that period where I was there, when things happened in the world, I don't remember them chronologically in my life and people will say to me, were you living under a rock? And I quite <laughs> smugly say, actually, yes. And we had two television stations and that was it. Um, but the amazing thing about visiting country, living on country and learning about it is how deep the meaning of place becomes. So I started learning about desert oaks. And what I love about them is they're really skinny and adolescent when they're young. And it's because their roots... I'm not a scientist, anyone, so forgive me for not using plant words. Um, the, when the desert oak's roots sort of reach down, they're really skinny, like gangly teenagers. But when their roots hit the water table, mm. they get fat and happy. That's what the Ananu ladies used to say, me, say to me. They're like really, you know, nyoka, the skinny one. And then once those roots hit the water table, they get fat and happy. And that's where the desert oak would um, branch out and get really big and their trunks would expand. And their seeds need fire to sprout and germinate. And so all of that, the metaphor mm. of all of that to take away from emotional experience and from life that happens to all of us that's inescapable. There's our skinny gangly time and then there's our fat happy time. And there's also the need for the fire and, and there's the also water. the need for the fire. Mm. Mm -hmm. I want to make a bit of a leap in a yeah. slightly biological uh, direction. Let's leap. You're right we are going to just do the three questions again I know. at the rate we're going. Ash said how many questions are we going to get through and I said in an hour about three. Yeah just <laughs> I got about 17 down here but that's fine. <laughs> Um, and and I, yes, we need to come back to things. Anyway, yeah. it's all right. Um, I can remember interviewing a, a card-carrying scientist a few years ago, a biologist, uh, who told me that one of the reasons he'd moved to Australia to work at an Australian university from the UK mm. was because he was sure that Australians all had this extraordinary and innate love of nature, that they were all biophiles, you know, that they must love the flora, the fauna, the geology, the topography of this place. He thought that was why we did all that bushwalking and camping and surfing and, you know, beach combing that we did. And so he moved here expecting to find a continent of biophiles. <laughs> As an Australian, I had to apologise to him. He works trying to protect the Great Barrier Reef, so you can imagine yeah. how he feels most days. But I wanted to ask you this question in two parts. Um, if you thought about Australia, about Australia's innate biophilia, if there is such a thing, say five years ago, mm. what would your sense of its nation, of the nation's engagement with its landscapes have been? And I mean that at a lived level rather than at a political level. How were people feeling about where they were in Australia five years ago? On a lived level, and to answer that with any sort of personal knowledge, Five years ago, I was, what year are we in? 2021. Yes. Okay, five years ago, I was living between the UK and Australia, which is what I've done for most of the last 12 years up until COVID. And I wonder if the truest way I can answer this is that I had no idea how much I depended on our exterior landscapes and specifically Australian exterior landscapes, mm. country here, until I thought it would be a great idea to move to the northwest of England <laughs> where everybody lives inside with heating or not because of heating bills. And my partner, Sam, who's English, says that living with me was like keeping an iguana <laughs> in a warm tank because our heating bill was part of our sort of budget for social life <laughs> because otherwise I can't exist in Manchester. But I would, there would be days where I would cry to Sam and say, but I can't even open a door. I can't, like, I just want to throw the house open. I want to be out in the backyard and have a picnic. What is this God-forsaken situation <laughs> where I have to wear a sleeping bag to go outside? <laughs> and that was 
honestly, my North Face, no, oh, no advertising. My jacket is like a, it is like a sleeping bag down to my knees with a hood. So all you see is this in my face and, and Manchester friends are wearing t-shirts. Mm. And so the lived experience of that is, I, I don't know if we know how incredibly, and I say we broadly and generally, of course a lot of us do know, but I don't know if we know how incredibly privileged we are to live on, on the natural landscapes of this continent. So I want to leap forward five years now. Mm -hmm. And not only has everyone had the bizarre situation of possibly reconnecting with one very particular landscape that they found themselves locked in, glued to. Glued to. Mm. Mm -hmm. But you have also had the very particular experience of travelling Australia mm -hmm. under the auspices of Back to Nature and, yes. and making this extraordinary series. What's your sense, or do you have a different sense mm. of people's um, access to landscapes, of their appreciation of, of the sort of currency or values the wrong word, but of their, of their responses and recognitions and appreciations of where they are after COVID, the unmentionable, always mentioned thing, mm. but also after this amazing experience that you've had moving through the country for this program. Yes. There's a three-pronged answer to this. Can you help me remember them? Sure. Okay. I'll count. Um, First Nations elders and guests on the show, making the show during COVID and meeting other guests on the show who remind me, maybe I'll start there, making back to nature and speaking to researchers and guests and plant lovers and nature lovers really drives home the answer that I just gave, mm. which is if we watched what comes out of the political leadership of this country, not that we're going to talk about that, um, it's very easy to think that we're kind of mad in our own love and care for nature that nobody else who is in positions of power seems to be doing anything about. But the people that I met filming Back to Nature, there are so many passionate people who love nature and are working to protect our mm -hmm. natural spaces. That was an extraordinary part of making the show. The other part was, <laughs> It was the first time I've ever stepped in front of a camera. So, and my mum would say that this is kind of the story of my life, like the school of hard knocks, right? So Holly has her first experience making a TV show, but make it happen during a global pandemic. Mm. So um, on top of the sort of fears and anxieties and, and terror and joy of making, stepping in front of the camera and being like, this is, okay, this is what I do with my life now. Um, it was doing it around really terrifying. We started filming March 2020, mm -hmm. which was when everything started to get really, really serious. And, and the show was meant to happen on paper, best case scenario, 10 weeks. It took us 10 months and jumping around border closures mm -hmm. and lockdowns and performing miracles in so many cases to make sure that we had the right crew and the right guests and that sort of thing. And so the passion of the producers and the directors of the show was to make something that would offer people an invitation to remember why being on country and being in nature is such a salve. It's because we are a part of it. And the great irony and, and amazingness about it was that while we were making it, we were in this bubble being protected by landscapes that were empty where COVID didn't exist by mm. all visual intents and purposes. And nature and country was giving us the very gift that we hoped to offer through the show. So there was that strange sort of living the message that we hoped to create with the show. And then the last thing was Having the, one of the reasons why I said yes to do, it, to, to, to do this, to make Back to Nature, was that I knew that it was the honour of a lifetime 
to travel the country and sit with First Nations elders and, and guests and have the privilege of listening to their stories, their relationship with country, their ancestral connections, their messages. And they really so generously offer this constant reminder and sense that country is alive and we are in a relationship with country. And when we are disconnected from it, we will, we will get sick in a myriad of ways. So it was... Um, I'm still trying to... How it's on TV, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still trying to process the fact that we got it made. But, yeah, it was... For all the hairy moments and the running to get to the airport before a state locked down with camera... Oh, my God, luggage and where are my floral pants and, like, <laughs> just all that chaos. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was a once-in-a-lifetime. It was amazing. Ten months is a long time. It was a long time. It was a, it was a long time for everybody of to and fro. Like, we mm. weren't filming that whole time because we would film and then we'd get shut down because there was no movement and then something would open up and then we would go and then the border would close and our crew would be in Queensland. So then production in Sydney had to work miracles and import a crew and brief them on the whole. It was wild. It was, I don't know how we did it. It was, it was wild. A lot of really good hearted people working really hard to make it happen. I'm going to remind you that in a minute you can all ask your questions if you're going to navigate the barcode slido hashtag thing. <clears throat> I'm sure you've got all of that the first time. I'll just keep going up here with the ones that I've got in the meantime. I will stop in a minute. Um, I wanted to talk against the um, complexity of a 10-month uh, filming yes. thing. There's a small matter of the Lost Flowers of Alice Hart, <laughs> which was a little bit more than 10 months in terms of putting it together. Yeah. And one of the most beautiful things that you did in the Lost Flowers of Alice Hart was to create this language of the flowers. And there's a couple of things, with one eye on the watch, that I wanted to talk to you about. One was to talk a little bit about the act of inventing this language from the other side of the world, because you were doing a lot of the writing for Alice when you were in Manchester. Yeah, I so wrote you the were whole first draft. away from yeah. this place. Yeah. And the other was, you know, which of the messages that are tucked in that book, which of the flowers or the plants do you sort of tuck closest to mm. you and carry with you now that Alice is making her own way in the world? Making up the language, making up the language of flowers while I was in Manchester, it was really following my gut. I, I don't know if anybody else in... I, I would bet that a lot of people in the room are artists or writers or, or creatives, and I, I would also bet that maybe this is a common experience for you as well. Lost Flowers was my first attempt at writing a novel from start to finish and sticking with it and not abandoning it. And at every turn, every time I got an idea, there was a gatekeeper with gnashing teeth saying to me, that is the shittest thing I've ever heard and no one's ever going to believe it and it's not going to work. And so it was constantly slaying that gnashed teeth bugger and uh, showing up anyway and, and bearing the agony of trying rather than crumbling from fear of, of that self-doubt beast. The one thing, there was still a lot of self-doubt. There was still like, this is um, awful and no one's going to believe it and who are you to do this? But the one thing that was a pure joy was sitting on my floor in Manchester in my office in our home while sleet hit the windows <laughs> and made rather charming, tinkling noises. <laughs> I didn't even know this type of rain existed where it wasn't hail. It's not like Queensland tennis ball hail. It's like tiny needles of sleet that hit the window. And I was on the floor, I remember really clearly being on the floor of my office with just pictures of Australian wildflowers spread out on the floor all around me and all that colour and that heat mm. from the books and soaking that into me. And the way that I made up a language, wherever relevant 
to Alice's life in the fiction. So when she's on Ananu land and, you know, on Pitanjara land, the flowers that head up each chapter have the medicinal or cultural uses of, um, of, of that plant, you know, to Ananu people because those are the, that's the first language of flowers, those medicinal storytelling purposes. Before Alice gets to the desert when she wouldn't have understood those meanings, there's sort of a number of chapters where she's raised by a grandmother on a rural Australian flower farm. And making up a language of what these flowers would mean, how women would use these flowers to communicate the, the unspeakable, I sat on my office floor and read about the way these flowers grow and survive. And just like we were talking about the desert oaks before, learning about the propagation habits of a flower, learning about what it takes for them to bloom, to, to seed, to grow, is so metaphoric. Mm. So really the plant would kind of give me what connecting emotion and then I would look at what chapter I was going to attribute that plant to so that I could tell Alice's story through the growth of how those plants survived as well. And what's your one that you take out of that language? I always, like, I always want to be, like, really mysterious, uh -huh. like, when I answer this. Yeah, I can see that <laughs> really working well for you. <laughs> and I always want to, like, pick an obscure one mm. that everyone will go, oh, I, yeah, I didn't expect that. But my heart is made of desert peas. Mm. It's, oh, it really is. It really is. And I've tried to grow them and I can't. They don't want to be grown. Mm. But they will grow between the, cro the, the cracks in the rocks outside of the IGA in the desert. <laughs> I used to see them when I would get out of my car to go and buy groceries, growing literally between rocks. But they just make me fall to my knees in wonder. And learning about how they grow was what reminded me of what it feels like to try and find courage. I'm going to turn my attention to the questions that are yes. jumping up here. Yes. Um, and the first one, oh goodness, oh. there's loads. This is uh, so Okay, <laughs> now this is complicated because I feel, uh, okay, in which little or big ways does country speak to you how do you connect to country and how can people living in the city connect more to country? Now, I feel we've gone a little bit around that space, but particularly in a time of less travel than usual, is mm. there something that, that comes to your mind in terms of those connections? Pot plants. <laughs> I feel like there is, I feel like remove the embargo on how many pot plants you can have <laughs> in your house. My partner Sam is dying because after I wrote Lost Flowers, when I did book tour for Lost Flowers, somebody said to me, do you have a lot of plants in your house? And Sam was in the audience and he's like, we have 200 at last count. <laughs> but they, they bring life in and you have to be responsible. You know, it's, I think there's a reason why when we are doing steps in our life to get out of maybe a, a damaged period in our life, people say, have plants first before you have a pet. Mm. And plants teach us that we are not in control because house plants are bossy, man. Like <laughs> you, you move them 10 centimeters to the left and you're gonna get dead leaves. Mm. They're gonna tell you where to grow. You overwater <laughs> them, you underwater them. Like, but I feel like in lockdown and in addition to how many people are often communicating with me or sharing how much that one hour in mm. under a, a by a, fo a footy oval or in the park or you know and we all know it from being in lockdown in the in greater brisbane when it's happened to us just being near anything living in the more than human world mm. is where that solace comes in so living in a city i just 
I just give you, I give you all the permission that you might need to go for the pot plants. <laughs> and don't check with Sam. Don't check with Sam. Um, I will ask you this because I know it was also mentioned in the things we were supposed to be talking about and someone's obviously looking at you as they ask this. Why are butterflies important <laughs> to you, Holly Ringland? <laughs> um, when I was little, uh, knowing that I grew up in mum and granny's garden, butterflies were everywhere. And so when I was little and I told mum that I wanted to be a writer, there was also a period that I went through where I thought it was a feasible and um, highly acceptable life goal that if I couldn't be a writer, then I wanted to be a butterfly. And if I couldn't be a butterfly, I was going through a phase of watching Annie, the mm -hmm, musical, the mm -hmm, original, mm. and I really loved the maid uniforms. Mm. So my life goals were writer, butterfly, or maid in a movie. I don't see there's any problem with exactly. that. Exactly. And the obsession with butterflies uh, has never gone, and there's nothing wrong with this, but has never gone into the pink glittery realm. Mm -hmm. I've always been really obsessed with the real thing, not just the image of it. And um, Eric Carls, the very hungry mm -hmm. caterpillar, not only did he encourage us all to just eat whatever we like, <laughs> but when I learned that that wasn't a fairy tale, that a caterpillar actually became a butterfly, I mean, how can you not believe in magic? Mm. Powerful transformation. Yeah, resilience, transformation, the things they have to go through, like eating their own bodily, uh, yeah. Again, scientific language, mm. um, but different moths and butterflies, like the things they have to go through to transform. Mm. It's I'm a deeply, le a metaphor metaphorically led person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would never have guessed. No. Um, no. I'm going to sneak one more of my questions in here just because I want to come back to that sentient mango tree yes. if we can. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if this is something that you might have been thinking about in the way that I have recently. There's so much amazing research coming out about communication between oh. different parts of biological systems. Yes. Conversations, interactions, exchanges, ideas of sentience. It's this amazing area of research. Mm -hmm. Susan Simard's The Mother Tree and Peter Wallabin's Hidden Life of mm -hmm. Trees, the amazing novel, The Overstory by Richard Powers. And I f you know, we're in this space where we're understanding more and more about the interaction between green space and mm -hmm. human mental health, you know, from neighborhood trees to national parks. As someone for whom the natural world has always been mm -hmm. important and you've mm -hmm. always had this sort of communication with Things like the mango tree or your, or your desert gangly teenagers. Yes, yep. How do all these pieces of research and revelation, I guess, speak to you? And particularly now, at this mm. moment in time. They humble me to the bottom of my soul. And, like, really. And they fill me, it fills me with equal grief and despair. Mm where I feel like I could cry myself dry for the trees and the forests and how they're not being protected, how they, what, how they can't be protected. And they fill me with the most humble joy and bewilderment and sense that there is so much more than human life on this planet, which is so easy in our culture to get dragged into mm. by our phones or our TVs. And this is not a shameless plug. This is coincidence, a very timely coincidence. Our episode of Back to Nature tomorrow night is about the wood wide web. Mm. What happens underneath our feet in the ground. And Aaron and I are in Macedon in Victoria and we walk through this forest where we learned and so me trying to like wind back my mind blown emotion as we were sort of talking about this information with the director before we filmed the scene that 
there, mo there is more and more research about old trees will sustain young mm. ones, sick trees will send out signals to protect healthy ones, and everything is connected through fungal networks to sustain everything else. And I mean, it, like I was walking sort of going, oh my God, can I put my feet? Like <laughs> this is, you know, the, the humility mm. of standing in a forest and just acknowledging that you are not, you're not the kingpin. There is a whole network of life going on all around you. And that more than human world fills me with grief and despair and so much joy and magic and, and a feeling of love mm -hmm. because they are alive. I, it's, like trying, it's like me trying to understand space or how the barge on the river is floating. Like understanding these matters, mm -hmm. it, takes my, it takes my mind into a sort of, yeah. <laughs> just, and just, you know, Julia Baird talks in Phosphorescence, her book Phosphorescence, about awe and wonder. Mm -hmm. And my God, if you are standing in a forest where trees are protecting each other and keeping each other healthy and that doesn't fill you with awe and wonder, we need to buy a lot of pot plants for your house. Mm. I think you've just answered the question that's just popped up, which um, is how, as a society, we can reduce the level of environmental destruction, just a small question, um, <laughs> and begin <laughs> connecting and appreciating and protecting the environment. And it comes back to this idea of, of, of um, understanding us in it. You know, it's not separate in the box over there and we change things and that impacts that. Mm. It is, it is the enormity of it and us as one small part of it. We are, we are a species mm -hmm. as trees are a species. We are nature and nature is us. And that's not flower power hippie, you know, even though I love, you know, obviously. <laughs> but, but we are a species on this earth and we are part of nature. And that is why when we are... You, I think that was part of what was behind Back to Nature is Aaron and I aren't experts. We're people that just love being outdoors mm. and love telling stories. And we don't have to go to the camping shop and have all the best gear mm. to get in the car and go somewhere not far from where we live to just notice what happens in your body when you walk through a rainforest mm. and you hear a whip bird call and from somewhere else its mate answers and then a butterfly flies past your face and maybe you see a lamington spiny crayfish if you're lucky. And that's all happening beyond where we get caught up here. Mm. And we're part of it. And Oliver Sacks did amazing neurological research into diagnosing people and, and giving them nature as their treatment. Mm. And the effects on mental health for being in nature and in green space. I think it comes to using whatever love and power we have to advocate for the love and power of nature. I think that's what it comes down to in our individual lives because the powerlessness is what is awful about protecting country. We've got about two minutes left. Okay. I'm going to sneak uh, one question in here, which is to give you the chance to give us a little sneaky sneak peek okay. of where you're taking us next, because there's a new novel coming next year, there Holly is. of England, I understand. My dear God, Ashley Hay. Mm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about, quickly, um, mm. the plants and the places that you might be introducing us to with Esther Wilding. Okay. I have no practice at talking about this novel, you guys. Okay. <laughs> Um, my next novel is called The Seven Skins of Esther Wilding. It is set between Tasmania, Denmark and the Faroe Islands. It is uh, about joy and grief and allowing us, allowing ourselves to feel both as an act of transformation. The plants are kelp forests and um, my god your noises you guys I love you <laughs> uh, kelp forests and 
noticing the ways that places are more similar than different and how stories are really specific to places. The end. <laughs> Elevator pitch. <laughs> Um, my apologies to everyone who braved the hashtag and did the Slido thing, and I know I didn't get to all of them. I didn't ask Holly if her favourite number was... I can't even see if it's 25 or 23 because my glasses are... I can't... Where's the name? Anyway, ice? so sorry. I missed that one. <laughs> um, yes, I apologise if that was important. We have come to the end of our time together this evening. Um, I've got a few particular thanks that I'd like to make. I'd like to thank State Library Queensland for the opportunity of being here in a real room, seeing all of you and seeing Holly, um, just for the opportunity of having this conversation. I'd particularly like to thank Duke and Melinda from Ausland yes. Services for their thank incredible you so much. translation. Um, thanks to everyone who's in the room with us. Huge thanks to everyone who is out there in the electrons. Holly is going to be outside the real room <laughs> signing books after this, so if you would like to keep having your conversation with her. You can do that in person and you can also do it through her words. There is something beautifully apposite in having this conversation and situating this beautiful, beautiful exhibition in Queensland. Mm -hmm. Queensland is Australia's most naturally diverse state. It's 13 terrestrial and 14 marine bioregions support more than a thousand different ecosystem types. Mm -hmm including rainforests, rangelands, the dry tropics, the wetlands and the coast. So I would argue there's no better environment in which to form and further your own relationship with plants than the one that we're in tonight. The entwined exhibition is on show until mid-November. You're welcome if you're on site to have a look now to explore it for a little while. Most importantly, would you thank me? Would you join me in yes. thanking you? Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> would you <laughs> would you join me in thanking the very wonderful Holly Ringland for her always generous and effervescent thank conversation? You. Thank you. Oh, you guys! Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, you guys. This is going to feed me for like the next six months <laughs> in the caravan. And thank you for. Masking up, we're very yes. grateful. Thank you.